Welcome, everyone. Uh, certainly thrilled to see so many people turning out uh, for what for Marlboro College is a momentous occasion. And uh, uh, in advance, just wanting to thank Howard for making the journey here from Boston by bus. Uh, The Brattleboro Area Peace and Justice Group has uh, simply asked me to announce the fact that they have weekly Monday night meetings at 7 o'clock at the River Garden for people that are interested. Uh, they've got a couple of upcoming events. Uh, one, a report from the Occupied Territories uh, focusing on Jews against the occupation on Sunday, February 22nd at 7, 7 p.m. at the Center Congregational Church. Um, and other activities that uh, I'm sure, you know, they would love to tell you about. So if you keep that in mind, uh, they would be grateful. And I think they're out in the lobby after the event, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it gives me very special pleasure uh, to introduce Howard uh, because I first heard of Howard Zinn when I was 16 years old and in high school, uh, not having a clue what I wanted to do, where I was going, where I wanted to go to college. Uh, I'd seen Allen Ginsberg and um, Lawrence Ferlinghetti read poetry, and I sort of dug that. And uh, a, a friend of mine in, in high school said, why don't you go to BU? Howard Zinn teaches there. And I said, sounds great. Who the hell's Howard Zinn? He said, he's a radical professor at BU. I said, OK, I applied to BU. And I got in. Now, I also was faced with the dilemma in 1968, the fall of 68 when I started college, of paying for college. Tuition back then was $3,100 for tuition, room, and board. And I had been actively solicited by B BU ROTC. And uh, not having the cash, said, they said, will you come and at least meet with us? And you know, we set up a schedule, and OK, I'll go, and we'll give you $1,500. Bucks and, the whole deal, I arrived at BU as a freshman, and lo and behold, the chapel had been occupied by students giving an army soldier, Ray Kroll, sanctuary from his military base. Uh, he had gone AWOL after he got orders to ship out to Vietnam. And so my freshman orientation was a week in the chapel with a 1,000 students in a 24-hour-a-day teach-in, sleep-in, eat-in, sing-in, dance-in, and who was at the center of the whole thing? <laughs> it was my initiation to be you, and as for the ROTC meeting, like George W. Bush, I never showed up. But what I did do was enlist in a different battle, and one that occupied a great deal of my life over the next seven years, which was to fight the war in Vietnam. And through Howard's classes, through his personal solidarity, through his leadership on the BU campus, through the role model modeling that he provided, advocating and committing civil disobedience, and unearthing scores of stories from the people's history of the United States. Before it was a book, uh, it became an experience for me that uh, changed my life and opened my eyes. When I think of a teacher and the ideal kind of teacher, it has to do with trying to cultivate voice in a student, in trying to develop critical perspective, and in cultivating a notion that there are things in life larger than ourselves that are worth committing to. And that, for me, was the gift that, as a student of Howard's and as a student at BU at that time, I was able to get. And it was the most valuable experience I've had. Last spring, uh, in New York, there was an event celebrating the one millionth copy of the People's History of the United States being sold. Now, in the publishing world, a million copies of a book is a lot of books. 
when the publishers made a deal on Bill Clinton's memoirs, for example, the publisher said, if we could sell a million copies of this book, we would be thrilled. And it would be well worth our, whatever, $8 million advance. But what did not, uh, but, but what frankly will not happen on Bill Clinton's autobiography is something that has happened with Howard's People's History. The publisher from HarperCollins was at the event, and he said, in my entire career as a publisher, I have never seen a book which increases its sales each year. So that some 18 years after its publication, this is a book that started out selling 25,000, 35,000 copies a year and is now selling 150,000 copies a year, having crossed the threshold and will soon, I am sure, break the barrier of 2 million copies sold. And that testifies, I think, to the power and to the infectiousness of Howard's gift in identifying a people's history, one that in the same way that he has supported and given voice to students, he has done for hundreds of years of American social movements. That night, writers and people who had been affected by Howard, Alice Walker, Kurt Vonnegut, Andre Gregory, Alfre Woodard, James Earl Jones, Danny Glover, Marissa Tomei, gave an evening of dramatic readings from historical figures from the book, from Mother Jones, Mark Twain, Emma Goldman, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X. As I say, a few years from now, we'll be selling, celebrating the two millionth copy, and Howard will continue to celebrate and inspire others with his customary generosity, accessibility, and grace. It is my pleasure to introduce Howard Zinn. Thanks. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> um, one of my great students, really. I mean, this is what makes teaching worthwhile, right? Because, you know, some of your students may end up working for the White House, and others may end up picketing the White House. <laughs> and those are the ones you're really proud of, <laughs> you see. So, uh, yeah. Jay did, a lot, Jay did a lot of things during the Vietnam years. He went to Vietnam, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to introduce him. Now that he's introduced me, right? You go back and forth, praising one another. <laughs> um, I thought Marlboro was a small college. <laughs> I, really, I, I said, yeah. <laughs> Where, where'd you come from? <laughs> oh, 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 wow. Really? God. I'm impressed. <clears throat> I don't know if I have anything to say to you. <laughs> I mean, you... Obviously, you, you know it. You know what's going on. You know what has to be done. I'm leaving. <laughs> so, but, you know, when you're, when you're a speaker, you have to tell people things, whether they know it or not. Uh, and so, here I am. Uh, and I'm supposed to talk about you know what I'm supposed to talk about? Have they said? I always hope that people don't remember what I'm supposed to talk about so I can talk about whatever I want to talk about, <laughs> which I'll do anyway, of course. <laughs> uh, but I, I, yeah, terrorism, history, right, stuff like that. Uh, but how did I come to this point? How's that for a good beginning? How did I come to this wise <laughs> understanding of the world? <laughs> uh, 
How did I come to think the way I do now about Bush, about war, about what's happening in the world? Uh, well, here's how I explain it when I explain it to myself, as I often do explaining things to myself. Uh, see, I became a historian, not because I wanted to be a historian. I didn't want to become a professional historian. I didn't really want to become a scholar. I didn't want to go to meetings of the American Historical Association. <laughs> didn't want to do that. I didn't want to write for scholarly publications. That's not what I wanted to do. No. I became a historian because I decided, oh, it would be, it would be good to know history. Because I had just one aim in studying history. I, you know, simple, modest aim. I wanted to change the world. Right? And I thought history was a good place to begin, right? See where, you know, you, you need to know history. Uh, and so, uh, I guess I, I came to this point of view uh, from, well, my own experience, my own life. I, I didn't go straight from high school to college to graduate school to teaching. It wasn't that kind of trajectory. I had. 10 years between high school and college, you know. At the, um, at the age of 18, I went, to, I went to work in a shipyard. I was a sh not as a sociological experiment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see what the shipyard workers are saying these days. <laughs> An oral history with the shipyard workers. <laughs> no, it wasn't that, no. No, I just came from the kind of neighborhood and the kind of family and the working class immigrant family, you know. You know, at the age of 18, you didn't go to college, you went to work. So I went to work in the shipyard and I worked there for three years. And I, by that time, I was reading, you know, reading uh, Upton Sinclair, Jack London, Karl Marx. I have to say that softly. <laughs> Uh, you know, John Steinbeck, yeah. Reading all sorts of things uh, that, that made me aware of what was sort of going on in the world. And, and I was, you might, you might say I grew up with a kind of class consciousness, yeah, about rich and poor and, and uh, about people who worked very hard uh, and uh, didn't have anything to show for it. And, uh, uh, so, years later, when I was teaching at Boston University, and I had many students in my classes who were, came from what you might call successful families, families that, you know, business professional people, and I would always have some students in my class, because we always had a discussion in my class about class. We just always had a discussion about things like that, and, and that there were always some students in my class would say, well, in, in the United States, if you work hard, you will make it. <laughs> the implication, of course, if you haven't made it, you obviously haven't worked hard. I knew this was a lie. You know, I knew, you know, I knew how hard my father worked. I knew how hard my mother worked. I knew how hard the people around me worked and they didn't have anything to show for it. And then I, I knew about these people. I saw their pictures in the Fox movie to the news on the, or in the magazine who had all that money and so on. And I couldn't tell what they did. And when I found out what they did, very often it was dangerous what they did and unhealthy what they did. I decided very early on that there was no necessary relationship between how successful you were in the world and uh, you know, how hard you worked or how intelligent you were. You know, well, what you contributed to society. And uh, so, yes, I had a kind of class consciousness. And I, I started working, organizing the young workers in the shipyard who were excluded from the craft unions. We formed our own union and stuff like that. I want to like to impress you with my proletarian background and, <laughs> and uh, my death-defying feats as, as an organizer of the working class. And so, uh, but, yeah, that's what I did. And, and then I enlisted in the Air Force, became a bombardier in the Air Force. I noticed that Jay diplomatically left that out of my uh, little biography. Uh, 
But uh, I did, yeah, I was a bum. Although, well, actually he and I just talked about that a lot just before we, we came here about my, well, he was he's, he's doing a little film. Well, he, he never does little films, but he was doing a li some sort of a film on uh, war and so on. He wanted to talk to me about my war experiences, which I'm always happy to do. You know, people have been in a war, love to lie about their war experiences. <laughs> uh, so I, um, but yeah, I was, uh, I, I was a bombardier in, in, in World War II, uh, the, the so-called good war, the, I, the best of wars. Uh, I, uh, as you know, there are good wars and bad wars. Uh, although I had a student once who wrote, uh, wars are like wines, the good years, bad years, uh, good wars, bad years, uh, bad wars. But she said, the wars are not like wines. A war is like cyanide, one drop and you're dead. No. I always remember that. Students can say memorable things. Sometimes teachers say memorable things. <laughs> but students certainly. War, yes. I came out of the good war. I came out of the good war, a war in which I had volunteered, in which I was an enthusiastic bombardier, in which I questioned nothing that I did, in which I questioned no bombs that I dropped, no target that was picked for me, in which I stood mute and was sat mute and listened as we were told to go over and bomb this little town in Fr France at the very end of the war when there's no reason to bomb anymore. You go over and bomb this little town in France and drop napalm on thousands of people, Germans and French, doesn't matter, whoever was down there. But, you know, um, like everybody else, sat there in the briefing room listening to the so-called intelligence people. I always laugh when I have to read, we just have an intelligence estimate. <laughs> well, we've just consulted the intelligence people, please. <laughs> that listening, but I, you know, but no, I never said a word, never even thought about saying a word because that's and it's one of the things I learned, you know, about what the military does to your mind. I mean, it's bad enough what the civilian may, may mass media does to your mind, but what the military does to your mind is even worse, you know, and you, so you do things without thinking, and only later, later, reflecting on it, do you ask yourself, well, what have I done, you know. But I, so I came out of the the good war in which I'd questioned nothing and began to question, you know, began to question when I read John Hersey's book on Hiroshima. And when I uh, read his accounts of talking to the survivors of Hiroshima, the uh, people who were blind or people without limbs or people with uh, skin that was unrecognizable as skin. Talking to these people and recording what they said, and what they remembered. And as I read John Hersey, this is a you know, short time after, after the end of the war, uh, suddenly was brought home to me, uh, what happens to people when they're bombed? I didn't know, I'd bombed, I'd bombed and bombed, I didn't know what happens to people when you bomb them, because I've been up there 30,000 feet. To this day, you know, you see these pilots coming back from these missions in Iraq. Wow, we scored a hit. Do you know what you did down there? Do you, did you see any people down there? You know, did you see, hear any screams? Did you see any blood? Did you see any decapitated people? No, no, you're up there. You're doing your job. Wow, we got terrific equipment. We dropped these bombs. Successful mission. As Bush says, mission accomplished. Yeah. So yeah, for the first time I thought about that. Uh, and, the, and reading about the people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki brought that back to me. Some years after that, I, I'm jumping ahead. I intended to go through my life year by year. Uh, and, uh, but don't worry, I'll come back 
and we'll still go through it year by year. <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah, sometime later in 1966, I visited Japan. I visited him at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There was a uh, international gathering in Hiroshima on August 6th to an international gathering, people all over the world gathering there under the auspices of a Japanese peace organization uh, to commemorate the dropping of the bomb on that day. Uh, and, uh, and I was uh, invited to visit something which is called the, you know, the House of Survivors in Hiroshima. It was like a community center where, where people who had survived the bombing of Hiroshima came to gather and be with one another. And, and, and so several of us from the international delegation were invited to be there. Uh, and uh, uh, and we were asked to talk to, to these people who were sitting there, something like you were sitting on the floor, maybe, maybe there were 70 or 80 people sitting there on the floor. Uh, and we were asked to say something to them as visitors from other countries. And somebody from Russia, and somebody from France. And then for some reason, I was delegated from among the few Americans who were there to speak to them as representing the American delegation. Uh, and I got up uh, and uh, I looked out at them. And I saw these people who could not see. And I saw these people without legs or arms. And I could not speak. It was the only time in my life. You noticed how I don't have any trouble. It's, it's, you know, nothing. You know, even Jay Craven doesn't prevent me from speaking, right? Uh, I can speak. I could not speak. You know. I tell you this, which I hadn't intended to tell you. I had a whole plan about what I intended to tell you, really. I was going to talk to you about terrorism and war, and then I decided you know all this. Well, I'll, I will talk about it anyway, but I'll talk about everything, you see. <laughs> year, year by year, hour by hour, month by month, <laughs> yes, everything. Uh, but I suppose I, I was prompted to tell you about that because it really, uh, um, really tells you how I came to have the feelings that I have had ever since World War II about war. And, uh, and you know, World War II is still the good war. World, World, war, II, World war II is still the, the really heroic war. Well, 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 you know, that's where, you know, and you see it in the movies, you see it on television, all those films about the D-Day and the assault on Normandy Beach and, and the, Saving Private Ryan and all of that. And World War II still has that great glow of goodness around it, and I resent it. <laughs> and the reason I resent it is not because there wasn't some sort of moral element in World War II which led me to go into it, fight against fascism, yes. No, yes, of course. But I resent it because World War II is now the model for war. You say, World War II is the good war, and that shows that wars can be good. Uh, and war now has a good name again. It was given a bad name during Vietnam, a really bad name. During the Vietnam War made people uh, down on war. That's bad. Now, we can't accept that in this country. We can't accept people being down on war. No, let's bring back World War II. And let's bring back the heroism of World War II and uh, the greatest generation and all of that. Uh, so that people will understand about good wars. It'll be easier to seduce them into the notion that here we have another good war, a war against tyranny and all of that. So, uh, but, uh, but, and I still, you know, still a minority. I'm just going by the sampling, the small sampling. This, I believe it's still a minority of, of people from the World War II generation who look upon that war critically, who 
who understand it wasn't simply a good war. It wasn't simply, oh, they're the fascists and we are the good ones. You know, that simple notion that if they are bad, we must be good. No, not necessarily. They could be really bad, and we could be bad. <laughs> and if we aren't bad at the beginning, we'll become bad as we get into war, because war makes everybody bad, because war corrupts everybody. Yeah, that's what it does. However good it seems to be, however just the cause seems to be, however it starts off as, well, yeah, uh, they're the evil enemy, and we are on the side of democracy and liberty and all of that. No. Uh, I, uh, so, you know, my, my experience, and then, and I was telling this to Jay before, so he won't mind listening to this again. I'll try to change the order of words a little so he won't get bored, you know. I'll try also to s take roughly the same point of view that I took when I spoke to him, <laughs> so I won't be accused of changing my attitude. You see. But, uh, I was telling him that how at the end of the World War II, I, like all these other, everybody else, 16 million served in World War II. And we all got a personal letter. <laughs> well, we thought we did. We all got the same letter at the end of the war from General George Marshall, the general of the armies, in which he said, no, congratulations, we've won the war. You've done your part. Uh, it will be a new world. <laughs> really. <laughs> For a moment, I believed it. For a moment, we all believed it. And then the world settled in on us. And what was the world like? What has the world been like since World War II? No. We got rid of Hitler. Great. Got rid of Mussolini. Great. Got rid of the Japanese military machine. Wonderful. Did we get rid of fascism in the world? No. Did we get rid of racism in the world? No. Did we get rid of war in the world after 50 million dead in World War II? No. Uh, war after war after war. And the, the rich and the poor, and the billion people without water, without clean water in the world. And yes. Uh, so, yeah, that experience, and my thinking back about that experience uh, has affected, yeah, my attitude towards every war we fought since has started me off with a suspicion. <laughs> no, I didn't start off from scratch. I didn't start off as a blank slate. I started off with an enormous suspicion about war. Certain fundamental things about war that should be said, just before we even get into the empirical data, before we get into the specifics of this war and that war, these facts and those facts, there's some, some general statements that I think can be made about war, which are a good starting point before you even get into the specific facts, because the specific facts can, depending on who you get your facts from, can mislead you and move you in some direction, but yeah, I think it's important to understand, well, yes, what I said, that war corrupts uh, everybody who engages in it, and also that in war, even a war against tyranny, the people you kill in war are the victims of the tyrant, right? Think about that. Those are the people you kill. You don't. You may kill the tyrant, or you may not. Hitler may die in his bunker, you know. Uh, but the people you kill, the people we have killed in Iraq, are the victims of the tyrant we claim to oppose. The thousands and thousands of victims of Saddam Hussein, they die under our bombs. The victims of the Taliban in Afghanistan, they're the ones who died under our bombs. The victims of Nazism and fascism, ordinary people of Germany, uh, as responsible for what Germany did as we are responsible for what our government has done in the world. You know, really. Uh, 
But they were the ones we killed. The ordinary people of Dresden and Frankfurt and, and the 100,000 people who died in one night of bombing in Tokyo and those hundreds of thousands in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Oh well, yeah, and so that's what happens in war. Uh, another basic thing about war, because uh, there's all this, you know, still talk about just war and good war and bad war and, and uh, still having sort of academic discussions and non-academic discussions about what is a just war and what is not a just war and is this just, you know. Uh, that war is always a horrible means of accomplishing anything. There's even, even the people who are for war Right? We'll tell you this. Everybody says this. The generals say, war is hell. They're all they're proud to say it. Happy to say, war is terrible. War is hell. Say, but, so there's the but. Beware of the buts. You know, like, I am for equality, but, you know, I love black people, but, you know, and so on. There's all these buts. And so, yeah, war is hell, but, you say, but this is what, but we have to do it. We have to do it. The end is good. We're doing it for this reason or that reason. You know. But there's something fundamental, what I feel is fundamentally true about war. The means of war, always horrible, especially in our time when the technology of war inevitably means the indiscriminate killing of large numbers of people. That's what war is, the indiscriminate killing of large numbers of people. Uh, those are the means. They're certain. That horror is certain. The end of war is never certain. However good the end is portrayed, however noble the end is presented, you know, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to accomplish this, we're going to get rid of this, the end is never certain. So, yeah, that's something to keep in mind. And then, of course, the other thing is that war victimizes everybody. <laughs> that is, when you make war, even if on a victorious war, even in an uneven war, an unequal war, you commit enormous casualties on the other side, and you have very few casualties of your own. No. There are always casualties on both sides of the war. There are the obvious casualties and there are hidden casualties. There are the unseen casualties. Uh, there are the people who don't make the statistics. Uh, there are the people who uh, are homeless and hungry and uh, without medical care and without resources in the country and who are the, the, in prison in the country and who are the, the overlooked and desperate in the country uh, because the resources and the wealth of the country have been given, given over to war. Uh, th those are the casualties that nobody talks about when they give casualty figures on both sides, so it's usually on one side in, in the war. So, so I, well this is a very, uh, it, you know, elaborate, that's what it seems to me, no, I like to think of it as concise, not elaborate, no. Perfectly concise. Uh, introduction <laughs> to uh, talking about this particular situation today, uh, terrorism and war. The other thing, the other preliminary thing, I only have a couple of hours of preliminaries, and then we really get to what I want to say. Um, the other, well, the other influence on my thinking about oh, what happens in the world, uh, besides my own personal history and all of that, is simply my study of history. Uh, no, I, uh, I leave the Air Force, I, I knock around at various jobs. I'm married, I have a couple of kids. I haven't really counted them, but uh, yeah, I think it's a couple, yeah. 
couple of kids. Uh, and uh, the work at some terrible jobs and decided to go to school under the GI Bill. GI Bill, remarkable thing. Whenever anybody says, can't you think of anything good our government has done? I say, let me think. <laughs> oh yeah, the GI Bill. There are a few things the government has done. Government can sometimes do good things, rarely, but it can't. Under the impact of certain events and certain movements and, you know, yeah, and the GI Bill, yes, was one of them, which uh, millions of veterans of World War II were able to go to college without paying a cent of tuition. And Jay was impressing you with how little tuition he paid at BU. That's, sorry, Jay, I paid nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All the way through, nothing. The GI Bill. Yeah, I went to school under the GI Bill, studied history. Uh, with all, all that behind me, you see, and knew, yeah, uh, what I wanted to do with history. You know. But the study of history, uh, I, I think, uh, especially since I was going to look at history from a class conscious point of view and from a point of view of somebody who, who uh, understood how he felt about war, uh, the study of history, uh, I think, prepared me for so many of the things that have happened in this country, you know, in these past decades. And, you know, think about it. Think about how, if you don't know history, how uh, disabled you are. If you don't know history, uh, and, and uh, this, is not a, a, right, this is not a theoretical thing, there are huge numbers of people in this country who don't know history especially people in the White House, you see. But maybe they do. Maybe they, actually, I shouldn't say it. Maybe they do and they don't care, you see. But there are a lot of people, but if you don't know history, then you can be easily fooled that anybody in authority can get up before the microphone and say, we must do this, we must do that, we must send our troops here, we must go to war there, and we're doing it for this reason and that reason and so on. If you had no history, how could you do anything to say, well, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's the president. <laughs> he has all these smart people around him. PhDs, Phi Beta Kappas, Yale Varsity. <laughs> anyway, you. If you didn't have any history, you might very well believe what you were told. If you knew some history, you would know immediately that you were being lied to. If you knew some history, you would know how often the American people have been lied to. By the way, not just the American people. People everywhere are lied to by their governments. It's a natural attribute of governments. That's well, true. When the, you know, there was in the early first half of this century, there was a great journalist named I.F. Stone. Some of you may have heard of him. He, he wouldn't work after a while for regular newspapers. He was a fantastic investigative reporter and journalist, and he put a, out his own little newspaper, a little four-page thing called I.F. Stone's Weekly, and he would dig up stuff that you wouldn't see you know, anywhere else. Uh, he was amazing. I.F. Stone's Weekly. And after a while, he got to be so well known, he would be invited to schools of journalism all over the country. And he would say to these students, young people who were going to be journalists, he would say, just remember one thing. You just have to remember one thing as a journalist. Governments lie. It's a good starting point. Uh, because when you, when you see the history of, of lies, you see, look at the history of American foreign policy. Lies all the way through. You see the lies that surrounded the Mexican War of 1846 to 48. The lies that surrounded the Spanish-American War and the war in the Philippines and World War I. And lies all the way through. And of course, more recently, the lies in Vietnam. Uh, and uh, you know, if you knew that history, uh, 
you, you would start off being strongly skeptical. Now, I won't say you start off knowing immediately it's a lie. No, I'm being moderate. You start off strongly skeptical. Because let's, 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 uh, let's accept the fact history cannot decide for you uh, conclusively what is true at any fresh moment. It's conceivable that some unique event has taken place. That the government is telling you the truth. No. Well, what has so no? But history can suggest probabilities. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Enough probabilities uh, to make you wary and skeptical and look further than the information given to you by the authorities. Uh, so, yeah. So my study of history, uh, yes, made me skeptical. Uh, about uh, official statements about why we were going to war. Uh, Kipling, Kipling once said, uh, if speaking with the voice of a soldier, you know, Kipling wrote a lot about war, and imperialism. Uh, if they should ask uh, why we died, tell them because our fathers lied. Uh, uh, so, yes. I, I assume I don't have to go through, because it's, it's the, all these lies that have been told to us recently, right? No, I don't have to, do I? You'd know about weapons of mass destruction. I mean, it's, it became ridiculous, right? R ridiculous. I mean, Colin Powell getting up before the United Nations saying, there is hard evidence for all these statements. So, um, Thomas Powers, who wrote, has written about the CIA uh, and knows a lot about that world, uh, sort of analyzed Colin Powell's uh, very impressive uh, list of all the weaponry that Saddam Hussein had. He said, uh, I find 28 false statements in Powell's report before the UN. And of course, you know, then all of the others, of Bush and Fleischer and Rumsfeld, and it's hard for me to pronounce, pronounce these names actually, you know, because, you know, I want to feel good. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, the, you know, but, uh, Rumsfeld, Ari Fleischer saying, it's a fact they have weapons of mass destruction. I mean, the, if presidents lie, the press spokespeople for presidents lie five times as much. That's their, that's their job, right? Uh, and, uh, and Rumsfeld at one time said, yes, yes, they have them, and we know where they are. <laughs> really, he said this, we know where they are. Okay, show me. Right, show me where. And then Bush, after the war had begun, Bush spoke in Poland. I don't know why he went to Poland. I never know why Bush goes anywhere, <laughs> except maybe just to get away, you see. But Bush spoke in Poland and said, we have found the weapons of mass destruction. It was interesting. Nobody else has found them. <laughs> but Bush, in Poland, <laughs> found them. And then, you know, it, it became more and more absurd where this Under Secretary of State Bolton said, you know, well, said maybe 
Maybe they, maybe they really didn't have weapons of mass destruction, but they had the intellectual capacity <laughs> to have them. That's, that's scary. <laughs> you know. uh, and then, of course, the Bush tries to, well, maybe we got bad intelligence. <laughs> this is, uh, if you read Machiavelli's The Prince, you will see that, you know, you know let's let an underling take the, <laughs> take the rap. Let the CIA take the rap for this. They gave me bad intelligence. Now, actually, if you look back at the CIA report, you see the CIA was trying to say to Bush, you know, it's not quite, they don't really have a nuclear weapon. And Bush was talking about mushroom clouds. And Condoleezza Rice was talking about mushroom clouds. I don't know where they started talking, you know, mushrooms. Mushroom clouds. What were they eating? What were they thinking? You know, a mush, mushroom, you know. And, but, you know, it's scary. They're trying to scare the hell out of the American people, really. Of course, to a great extent, they succeeded. I mean, this is a terrible thing, that they could succeed in scaring people with absurd statements. Somebody made a survey. Not a friend of mine, I assure you. I don't believe the survey is made by friends of mine. Uh, so, uh, some group that does public survey. And they found that, and they were uh, ch checking the opinions of Americans based on uh, what they read and what television programs they want, watched. And they, f they found that of the people who watched, who got their news from Fox television, 80% of them believed that we have found weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and, and believed that Saddam Hussein was connected with 9-11, uh, you know. Uh, well, uh, if, yeah, fear, all this fear, which is easy, easy to create. Same thing, the same thing was done during the Cold War. Remember those fears that were created during the Cold War, which people uh, believed because the media went along with, with the government, as the media almost always goes along with the government, the only time the media changes is when people change, when the public changes, when a movement is created, and, and, the, and then the media, never to take the lead on anything, you know, they begin to follow, and then you know, they begin to get, they get critical. Uh, but uh, what always uh, uh, amused me, although there's nothing amusing about these things, but if you don't find anything amusing, and things like <laughs> this, it's hard to live, you see. You have to find something. What, um, yeah, it's sort of amusing. It's, actually, it's terrible. But <laughs> try to find it amusing. But here they are talking about weapons of mass destruction. And uh, they don't know, but they think they know, they had intelligence report this and that. And then, they, and even, the, even they say, well, he, he, we know who he is, may have one nuclear bomb, not now, but maybe a couple of years from now, he might have one nuclear bomb. The United States has 10,000 nuclear weapons. I did not find people in the press, in the mainstream press, talking about the weapons of mass destruction possessed by the United States of America. <laughs> not find that. You know. You know. And, uh, and Bush, Bush said again and again, and Condoleezza Rice said it again and again, because she says again and again what Bush says again and again, and he says again and again what Condoleezza Rice says again and again. And, oh, and they have used them. Oh, well. And, and they you remember the gas, the gassing of the Kurds, absolutely true. Saddam Hussein, ruthless, 
man used gas against the Kurds in 1988. And, yeah. They used them. Who has used weapons of mass destruction more than the United States of America? I mean, nobody talked about that. I mean, who talked about mushroom clouds? What was the only, the only nation that produced mushroom, mushroom clouds over cities? You know, at one point, uh, after the, they started talking about his weapons of mass destruction, I got a letter from uh, Kurt Vonnegut, who I just you know, like to drop a name once in a while. <laughs> Uh, Jay Craven. <laughs> That's a bigger name to drop here than Kurt Vonnegut. They, I got a letter from Kurt Vonnegut. We've become sort of friendly. I could say we've become intimate friends. No, no we've become sort of friendly over the last couple of years. And he sent me a copy of a letter that he had sent to the Times. A very short letter, because that's the way he, you know, he does these, he's a little bizarre. Because, as you know, if you read his stuff, he, 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 uh, there was all this talk in the press about weapons of mass destruction. And his letter was very brief to the New York Times. It said, I know of only one country in the world that has dropped nuclear weapons and blown to dust and ashes hundreds of thousands of people. That was his letter. Times did not print it. Uh, so, uh, enough on weapons of mass destruction. But, you know, when they ran out of that, they went into the business of tyranny, right? Well, you know, okay, they don't have weapons of mass destruction, but still, it's good that we got rid of Saddam Hussein. And who disagrees with that? Right? Who disagrees? It is good that we got rid of Saddam Hussein. But there are questions surrounding that. You know, uh, did we go into Iraq to get rid of Saddam Hussein? Did we go into Iraq because we don't like tyrants? A little history comes in handy. <laughs> history will tell you, we love tyrants. We have loved many tyrants uh, all over the world. So, so long as they do what we say, so long as they play ball with us. And, uh, and if there isn't a tyrant in power, we'll put a tyrant in power, so long as we know that he will play ball with us. And so, you know, the, the United States has not been in the business of creating democracies in the world and ousting tyrants. If anything, it's the opposite, and, right? If anything, you know, we, we ousted a democratically elected government in Iraq, in Iran in 1953, and, and in came the Shah, the tyrant of tyrants, ousted uh, with, with the help of the CIA and secret operations, the democratically elected government of Guatemala in 1954, and immediately ushered in years of a reign of terror, uh, killing hundreds of thousands of people in Guatemala. Uh, we, got, we worked to get rid of a democratically elected president in Chile, remember, in 1973? And, and came in Pinochet and, and the death squads and so on. Again, I mean, it's a long list of Marcos in the Philippines and the dictators of Central America and Sukarno in, and Suharto in, in Indonesia and so on. So the idea that the United States is offended by the existence of a tyrant in the world <laughs> is absurd, you know. Uh, and uh, you know, I think when I think of that, I, I think of. I, th I, think of, I think of Spain, I think of Cuba, I think of 1898, I think how, you know, there's something comparable. Because there are situations where you're glad to get rid of a tyrant. And, but there are other questions to be asked about it. What happens then? And at what cost? What happens then? We get, in 1898, we get rid of the Spanish tyranny over Cuba. Move into Cuba, defeat Spain in three months. Spain is out. Great. We are in. 
Spain is no longer the ruler of Cuba. The United States is the ruler of Cuba. Spain is out. The American corporations are in. And does Cuba have democracy and liberty and prosperity then? No. Cuba becomes a, a vassal of the United States, and, and the United States has a right to militarily intervene in Cuba any time it wants. And Cuba becomes a playground for the American rich and, and a corrupt satellite of the United States. You know. So you, you get rid of a tyrant, but what happens then? Oh, we're seeing it now. We got rid of Saddam Hussein, and what happens now? What are the prospects for democracy and liberty you know, in, in Iraq? You, know? you might think there's a better prospect for democracy and liberty if we cared about that, if the government cared about it. That's not what the government cares about. The government cares about a, a government which is stable enough and friendly enough. Saddam Hussein had stability through iron rule and cruelty, he, but he wasn't friendly enough. He had to go. So we're going to try to get a friendly government in there, democratic or not, doesn't matter. The other point about getting rid of tyrants, because it's good to get rid of tyrants, is you also have to ask, at what cost? And you see very little about this in the papers. You see very, you know, it's, it's sort of a, an, an abstract question. You know, here's a tyrant. He's no longer here. That's good. At what cost? How many people have died in the, in the course of getting rid of this tyrant? How many, yes, as I said before, of his victims have died? How many Iraqis have died in this war? You, you're not even told that. The United States government is not, and the press isn't interested in how many Iraqis have died in this war. They don't bring it up. They don't bring up the cost, the cost of removing a tyrant. Uh, nobody knows how many Iraqis died. In this very short war, the estimates are from 7,000 to 20,000. Civilians, that's just civilians, that's not just the military. Very often they talk about innocent civilians. I, I don't like that statement. The implication is the soldiers are not innocent. Who are the soldiers who die in wars? They're innocents too. They're poor, miserable conscripts in getting into the army out of desperation, like soldiers everywhere. You know, they're the victims, too. So there's a human cost to the war, a human cost on the other side and a human cost on our side. And so we got rid of Saddam Hussein, and five, over 500 Americans have been killed. Uh, now, uh, some of, the, some of their families are asking questions. Did you know that? Some of those families of people who have been killed, they've been asking questions. What is this all about and what is this for? Uh, and uh, there's an organization called Military Families Against the War. Uh, and uh, on, well, only 500. Right. It was a story about a, a young GI, who was blinded in, uh, in the Iraq war. And uh, uh, his mother is, visits him, and the reporter talks to her, and his mother tells how in going to visit her son, she passes all these other cots of people without arms and legs, and she sees a young woman soldier uh, without legs crawling along the floor with her little child crawling behind her. Uh, that's, that's a cost of war. If you are going to have that kind of cost, you had better have something really, really great, important, powerful to show for it. We don't have that. We don't have that because that's not the aim of the government, to bring democracy and liberty to Iraq. Uh, um, I said I would talk about terrorism, and I haven't said a word about terrorism. And it's, uh, but I have, as I buy my watch, I have a couple of hours to go. Uh, <laughs> So, a few things, just a few things about terrorism. A terrorist act takes place on September 11th, 
2001. Unmistakably, a terrorist act, a terrible act takes place. Uh, what is the proper response to that? I mean, obviously, you know, terrible sadness, grief, help, you know, relief, this, that, but what is the proper, what do we do? Well, Bush knows immediately what to do because he's been planning for it. I don't mean that he's been planning for September 11th. I know there are people who have these th theories, you know. No, it's not that, no. But even before September 11th, the Bush administration was thinking about invading Iraq. Yeah, we, we know that now from, you know, right, people close to the Bush administration. And it's not surprising, that's the way they think. But what does Bush do? Immediately declares a war on terrorism. And, well, yes, somebody, you've been attacked, you go to war. What, is, what, what, is, what are people thinking? They're thinking it's like Pearl Harbor. The Japanese have attacked us, we go to war against Japan. But, no, it's not that way. Terrorism is not an identifiable place that you can declare war on and then comfort yourself that you are attacking the people who committed this act. It's not that at all. You don't know where these people are. You don't know who they are. Oh, well, you think and you probably maybe even know that some of them are in Afghanistan. Only some of them, because they're actually all over the world. And you've said so yourself. The administration has said so itself. Terrorists all over the world. But there are some in Afghanistan. So what do you do? You bomb Afghanistan. You don't, you don't just look for the people who you think may have masterminded this and get after them and do something, arrest them, do something. No, you just bomb Afghanistan. You kill the victims of, yeah, so the Taliban tyranny. Uh, how many died in Afghanistan? Nobody knows. Somebody in New Hampshire made a, tried to do a very, very specific count of newspaper items abroad in here, came to 3,000, 4,000. Well, Americans visiting Afghanistan, American families who had lost, lost members of their family in the Twin Towers and who were opposed to a military reaction went to Afghanistan to meet with Afghan families who were the victims of our bombing. And I remember reading the report of one of them as he talked about encountering this Afghan family who had lost half the members of their family. And there were these young, these kids. And the kids uh, had no speech. The kids had lost their power of speech. Uh, they had been under bombs. If you've been bombed, anybody who's been bombed uh, has an idea of what bombing can do to you. Even if it doesn't kill you or wound you, when they use those terms shock and awe, yeah. bombing can do things to your mind, can render you mute, can have all sorts of effects on you. But that, that's the war, war, a war on terrorism. You pick out some place in the world and you bomb it. And you satisfy the people who say, well, we've got to do something. I always like that response. You've got to do something. Remember the Hippocratic Oath. If you don't know what to do, first rule, do no harm. Uh, and uh, did we get rid of terrorism? Did we diminish terrorism by bombing Afghanistan? Have we diminished it by a bombing of Iraq? No. <laughs> Have we made ourselves more secure, more uh, everybody feels safer now? Oh, thanks. <laughs> hmm. Thanks, Jay. Students, it's good to have students. Uh, it's, they will do things for you. Uh, at first I thought Jay was pointing to my watch. <laughs> no, he's, t but maybe this is a way by drinking of this water. It will lead me to look at my watch. <laughs> Vermont water. <laughs> uh, 
anyway. It's a fake. The war on terrorism is a total fake. Uh, you can't deal with terrorism that way. You can't just pick out a country and make, drop bombs that we're making war on terrorism. No, that, that's, no. And besides, war itself is terrorism. That's an important thing to keep in mind. War is terrorism. You know. So we, you know. So we respond to terrorism with terrorism, which may lead to more terrorism. And then it becomes an endless cycle of violence, like we're seeing in Israel, right? I mean, Israel responds to suicide bombers with, you know, well, indiscriminate attacks on, uh, you know, people in the, in the occupied territories, you know, breaking down their houses and, you know, killing people, you know, it's, you know, because we've got to respond, we've got to do something. Yes, you've got to do something. You've got to sit down intelligently, think, what, what can we do about terrorism? And if you, if you think about it, well, it's, it's, it does seem that uh, simply going after this terrorist, that terrorist, that terrorist, dropping bombs wherever you feel like, that is not going to end terrorism. In fact, it's going to increase terrorism. Because if you think about it, the terrorism does not come from simple madness. It comes from people with deep grievances who are fanatic about that. There are a lot of people with deep grievances against us, but only a small number of them will become fanatic enough to engage in acts of terrorism. But if you want to do something about terrorism, you have to think about those deep grievances about that exist among millions of people out of whom a small number will become terrorists. Uh, you, know, you can't swat at the mosquitoes that are carrying yellow fever, you have to drain the swamps where the mosquitoes breed. That's what you have to do. And so you have to figure out what, you know, what, uh, what is behind this terrorism. And it does have to do with, with the United States policies in the world. Nobody wants to face that. No, people don't want to discuss that. It's embarrassing to do it. It's unpatriotic to take a hard, critical look at the United States foreign policy and say, we have been doing terrible things in the world. People in Europe know that. People in the Middle East know that. People in Africa and Asia know that. Why do you think they were against this war by such overwhelming numbers? They see the United States as the bully of the world. We have, have our military bases everywhere, over 100 military bases in the world. We have our warships on every sea. Uh, we are the super colossal military power and the super colossal financial power, <laughs> intruding our corporate power into their countries and, and despoiling them and calling it you know, globalization, which has a nice ring to it, uh, but which means something other than, uh, than equality. So, uh, yeah, it's a matter of fundamental change in policy. It would seem a simple thing Simple question to ask uh, when you ask, well, why, why us? Bush says, well, it's because we have democracy and liberty. <laughs> of all people to say that, you know. Uh, there are other countries in the world that have democracy and liberty. How come they weren't the victims of terrorist attack? You know? uh, is it possible? What is it that makes the United States unique? <laughs> what makes us the unique target of this vicious act of terrorism? You know, and it becomes clear. We are the great superpower with our military activities everywhere and our intervention everywhere and our economic power everywhere. Uh, yeah. I mean, is it only a, a coincidence that they picked on the World Trade Center? the representing financial power, and the Pentagon representing military power? Why not bomb Dunkin' Donuts? <laughs> I mean, uh, there must be a reason for picking out those particular places. Uh, so that suggests something. If we really want to do something about terrorism, we have to do something fundamental about 
America's role in the world. We have to stop being a marauding nation in the world. Uh, we have to give up the idea of being a benign imperialist, as some of our intellectuals seem to delight in thinking about. You know, we are a new kind of imperialist, a kindly, gentle, soft uh, imperialism light, yes. No. Uh, no. Uh, no, we have, to, we have to pull our troops back from wherever they are all over the world. What are they doing? They're not defending us. I like the way the word defense is thrown around. No, Bush, you know, it's three, three days after uh, September 11th, uh, establishes the idea of we can unilaterally take preemptive action for self-defense. Defense? How is bombing Afghanistan defense? How is bombing Iraq defense? How, you know, it's, it's absurd. We're not defending ourselves. We are the aggressive power in the world. We have to stop being the aggressive power. See, we have to stop. We have to. And we, we have to turn, we have to take the immense wealth that we have in the world and use it for other reasons than war. We have to take these resources that we have and use them for not only in this country, but other parts of the world that desperately need it and that with a fraction of our military budget could take care of the problem that a billion people in the world have of not having clean water. We can, we can s actually save the lives of millions of people uh, with the, the money that is allocated for our military budget. Uh, we can do amazing things with this wealth, both in this country and elsewhere. We could, yes, let's be a superpower. Let's be a, a humanitarian superpower. Let's, let's, let's be powerful, but not in a military way, but using our resources to, for the world and, and for ourselves, you see. And uh, it's, uh, it's possible. <laughs> that is, it, it doesn't look very possible right now. But it is, you know, things never look possible. Here's another thing I learned. Yeah, I want to give you the benefit of my wisdom. Uh, another thing I learned, actually learned this in the South, learned this teaching in the South, becoming involved in the civil rights movement, seven years teaching at a black women's college in Atlanta, and being involved in the movement. And what I learned is that uh, things can look hopeless as they looked for black people in the South in the 1950s, really. Hopeless against enormous power, you know. And people started to act and started to act and started to act and the movement grew and grew and grew and grew. And these so-called powerless people became a power in the South. Just the working people became a power when they organized and went on strike. And the anti-war movement and the women's movement and the gay and lesbian movement and the disabled persons movement, all these movements started very small and apparently hopeless situations. But people persisted and after a while they learned that there, there is a power in people which all the, the might of the military and of money at a certain point in history cannot suppress. And, uh, and it's, all, it's up to us to do our little part. If millions of people do their little part, you will have something big happening. And then you will live in a country that is liked, <laughs> a country that is liked all over the world, uh, and, uh, and be proud, yes. So, um, we have all sorts of people on our side. All sorts of, that there are immense numbers of people all over the world and in this country who are on the side of good things and no war, economic justice, no race, huge numbers of people. And it's just a matter of beginning to organize. That's all, nothing big. Thank you.
So Howard has offered to take a few questions. People have something they'd like to ask? <clears throat> yes. Yes. Uh, how come the Iraqi insurgents um, are killing those who, uh, those Iraqis who want a democracy, killing those who want to be policemen, killing themselves? Yeah. It happens, it, ha it happens a lot, you know, in situations like this where uh, the people, uh, the r a rebel group in a country uh, feeling desperate uh, will, uh, and thinking that their cause uh, is being hurt by people of their own kind joining the other side, they look for uh, people they call collaborators, you see, and they make examples of them and they kill them. It's an ugly business. It's an ugly thing. You know, in, in, the, the, in the Second World War, the, the free French, you know, uh, killed other French people who were collaborating or who they thought were collaborating with the Nazis. And so that seems to be what's happening now in Iraq. It's, uh, it's a terrible thing to see. Uh, I don't know if they're just killing people who believe in democracy. That I'm not so sure. But they're certainly, they're killing people they think are somehow associated with the occupying power. And uh, this happens whenever a country is occupied. Uh, that there are people who collaborate with the occupying power and then they're looked upon as enemies by people who oppose the occupation. Yes. Mm. Democratic mm. What do you think of that from a historical Did you hear that? No. You said some people have compared Bush to Hitler. And what do I think of that from a historical perspective? Hitler was a much better speaker. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, no, no, there's, no, it's, I, I don't, no, I don't, yeah, no, I don't like to do that. I don't like to compare Bush to Hitler. Bush is Bush. That's bad enough, <laughs> you see. And we, we don't have to, you know, we don't have to compare him to Hitler. But uh, I do feel, although, you know, it's a hard thing to say, you know, but I do feel that they're fascistic elements. Let's put it that way. No, no, this is not Nazi Germany, and we have all sorts of openings and apertures, and we can have meetings. You know, there, we have certain limited democratic rights that people don't have in totalitarian states. But they're, they're, you know, when, when you have a Patriot Act, when people are picked up you know, when off the street and taken away, and you never hear from them again, uh, that, uh, that that's a, a resembles the kind of things that happen in, you know, in Mussolini's Italy. But I don't want to make these comparisons because then, you know, it's an exaggeration, you see. And I don't want to exaggerate, it's, you don't have to exaggerate in order to make your case for something that is bad in itself. Yes. Yes. I hear you. I don't know. You know, I, I, and for me, it's not the most important issue, really. It's, it's yeah, if, if that were true, it's even more frightening than what we already have. But what we already have is frightening enough. What's frightening enough is that Bush used 9-11, whether he knew about it or didn't do anything about it. So Bush used 9-11 as an excuse to do what he wanted to do anyway. 
He used the fear of 9-11 uh, to create this, this atmosphere of uh, uh, terror, really. <laughs> we are, you know, who is, we're being terrorized by our own government in a sense. They're creating an atmosphere in which we are terrorized. We're afraid of terrorism after 9-11. Of course, we have a right to be afraid of terrorists. We have also, uh, but there's a distinction to be made between a reasonable fear and an irrational fear which leads you to do uh, yourself inhuman and even terroristic things. And what happened during the Cold War is the fear of communism became so uh, irrational and overwhelming, you see, that, that all sorts of terrible things were done to human beings in the name of anti-communism. And communism was real. Soviet Union was real. The Soviet occupation of Eastern Europe was real in the way that the terrorism is real and 9-11 was real. But it, the reality was magnified enormously, uh, irrationally, so that it wasn't just the Soviet Union and, and Czechoslovakia and Hungary. It was the Soviet Union everywhere. Communists everywhere. If there's a revolution in if there's an uprising in Vietnam, uh, it's part of the world communist movement. And so it led that, that excuse of the existence of the Soviet Union uh, enabled the United States government to do terrible things all over the world, in Latin America, in the Far East, in the name of fighting communism. Uh, and, uh, and that's what's, uh, you know, I believe that's what's, what's happening today also. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Um, if you had been uh, in the White House and the president, um, from, and from and, and a, and a, an individual with a historical perspective, in the hours and days after 9-11, what are some of the thoughts that you would have had and some of the actions that you might have taken? <laughs> I've, I've often placed myself <laughs> in the White House uh, at a crucial moment in history. Uh, no, well, no, it's a, it's, it's a reasonable question, uh, but I suppose you're saying, what would, what would a, a reasonable and intelligent person like myself <laughs> do rather than what was done? Um, I would, uh, I would go before the American people, yes, you have to talk to the American people, uh, as Bush did, and uh, of course he told them he's going to now have a war on terrorism and uh, be willing to take preemptive action, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Go before the American people and tell them this something terrible has happened, uh, a terrorist act has been committed against us. Uh, the, we don't, we, you know, the people who committed it, of course, dead, but they're probably people who planned it, and maybe they're people planning more terrorist acts. And uh, we, we'll enlist the, uh, uh, you know, we, we'll, we'll treat it as a, as a terrible crime and see if we can find the criminals uh, and enlist international agencies and international police forces to find the criminals. But as with a, a criminal act, you don't, uh, we're not going to, if we find out that a criminal is hiding in a neighborhood, we're not going to bomb the neighborhood in order to possibly find the criminal. So we'll, if we can do a focused action to try to find who's responsible, yes, we'll do that. But if that isn't enough, because you can, you can find people who are responsible for criminal acts, and those criminal acts will occur again and again if the fundamental social conditions reproduce criminality. Uh, I mean, that's as true of crime as it is of terrorism, you know. And, in fact, we have the experience with crime. You know, sure, you lock up these people, you lock up these people, you lock up these people, and the crime continues. And soon you have two million people in jail, and crime continues, you see. Uh, so, so you have to think the unthinkable, you see. And f when it comes to crime, of course, the unthinkable for the United States government and for the local government, the unthinkable is to create the social and economic conditions which will not lead to the desperation and poverty and drug addiction that leads to so much crime. 
That, but no, they don't want to change these economic and social conditions. They don't want to do that. That would require a restructuring of the economic system. That would require a redistribution of wealth. That would require heavy taxation on the rich and new social programs. No, not going to do that. So we'll just lock up people more and keep locking them up. But no, so with, I would tell the American people, we've got to think about, about what is causing uh, people in the world, not just these terrorists, but many, many other people in the world, obviously angry at the United States. We've got to think about that. We've got to think about what policies we have followed uh, that have caused that anger. And we have to reconsider those policies. And, uh, you know, there, there, there were three particular policies uh, that uh, were actually mentioned by the people who were supporters of these terrorists. And, and these are three policies which not only angered the terrorists, but have angered millions of people in the Middle East. And those three policies are the stationing of troops in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and other places in the Middle East, the uh, maintaining of sanctions on Iraq, which have killed a half million children in Iraq, the support of Israel's occupation you know, of the West Bank and Gaza. These are, these are policies which have infuriated many people in the Middle East. We ought to reconsider those policies. We, have to, we ought to think about whether we want military forces all over the world. Uh, the United States is a powerful country. We're not in danger of being invaded. We're not in danger of being attacked. The only time we're in danger, the only thing that we can have to fear is this kind of attack which comes out of the policies that we have followed in the world. This is not to excuse the attack or justify the attack, far from it, but to understand it so it won't happen again, so, or at least so that we can reduce the chances that it would happen again. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any Marlboro students that have questions? Yeah. <laughs> You're a Marlboro student? <laughs> Yeah. I'm sorry, just want to make sure that they get the Yeah, questions. okay. Um, Mr. Zinn, it seems like to some extent you're preaching to the converted right now. Uh, I was wondering what you thought your success was in people who maybe weren't initially receptive to what you were talking about. Well, preaching to the converted. <laughs> a lot of converted. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to preach to a lot of converted, it's true. But even converted need, well, what do they need? I think about this. When I come to a place where I, I say, oh, I think these people are probably agreeing with me. And I think, what can I do? I have this sinking feeling that I can't do anything for these people. Well, maybe I can give them a little information that they didn't have before to buttress the arguments that they can use for the non-converted, you know, to sort of arm yourself for, with, with ideas that you could present to the non-converted. You know, sometimes it's a, it's a thought you know, that the, that the non-converted didn't, didn't have and that you might make them think about. You know, like, hey, who are we bombing? We're bombing the victims of the tyrant, you know? Or does war solve anything, really, you know, fundamentally long term? Anyway, but, but let, me, let me get to your question because, you know, I've dodged it long enough. <laughs> and and the, uh, I, I don't always speak to the converted. Uh, I, I speak to all sorts of groups. It's not that I speak to the American Legion or the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, they haven't invited me, but I would speak to them if they did, <laughs> you see. But I speak to uh, college audiences around the country which are very unlike Marlboro College. I don't know if you know this. <laughs> Marlboro College is strange. <laughs> But, I mean, for, you know, l last year I spoke to, sometime last, and when, fall, I spoke at Moorhead State University in Moorhead, Kentucky, okay? Hotbed of radicalism. <laughs> Moorhead, Kentucky, you've heard of Moorhead, Kentucky. Uh, 1,500 people show up, students at Moorhead mostly, uh, maybe a few community people, told them, not in the same words, but 
Basically, I spoke to them about war and about this war and about their government and about priorities. I spoke just the way I'm speaking here, the, this point of view. They gave me a tremendous reception. The Moorhead State University. I don't think, I doubt that they all started off there. I'm, no, I'm not saying maybe, you know, maybe they're just being polite, okay? <laughs> but I like to think that uh, there were many of them who did not already agree with me and who may, by what I said, have been given some second thoughts. Who knows? I, I don't expect to have profound effects on people I speak to. I expect, I, I'm, I'm thankful if I can just drop a little glimmer of something into their minds that will make them think about something. I talk a lot to high schools. I like to talk to high schools. High schools are not the converted. High schools are, you know, the high school kids are the most militarized part of the population, right? They, you know, first of all, they, they live in a totalitarian institution, <laughs> you know, they, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I, I speak to these high school assemblies, which means all the kids in the high school have been forced to come <laughs> into this assembly hall to hear me speak, you know. Uh, why I've been invited, I'm not sure. You know, is, is the principal a secret Marxist? Is the, uh, you know, is, is there a radical faculty member who, who's, you know, threw my name out and nobody ever heard my name, says, yeah, I'll let him come, <laughs> you know. So, I don't know. But I speak to high school assemblies a lot. And I talk to them as strongly as I can about the war. And frankly, although I don't like to, full rank and so on. I do. It helps a lot to have been in a war with kids who think war is, you know, I'll join this, you know, the greatest generation and all of that. It, help, it helps. I, I don't like to make too much of my enormous record of heroism, uh, <laughs> but uh, just drop it quietly. Uh, but uh, let's put it this way. High school, the high school students are wonderfully receptive to what I say, at least at the moment. <laughs> I don't know what happens afterward. I don't know what effect I have. I guess all I'm saying is, and this is, anybody who teaches knows this, when you teach, you don't know what effect you are having on your students. Uh, you don't get immediate results, <laughs> you know. Uh, but Years later, very often, you run into somebody who was a student 10 years ago and says, you know, well, you know, what you said meant a lot to me or something like that. And then you realize that something you didn't know about at the time was taking place. That teaching is a kind of act of faith. And talking to people, uh, whoever they are, converted, unconverted, is a kind of act of faith. And the idea is that if you, if you say something that you believe is true and with a conviction and if people think you're honest about what you're saying, well, maybe you'll have some effect. Thank you. Yes. I, I wonder if you can help me. I, I, I felt that there's a real, there's a lot of propaganda on both sides, the liberal side and the, the conservative side. And I find it, from a historical perspective, can you explain to me how it is that a, a Bush is not alone, there's all sorts of Republicans behind it. And all these people have families, and all these people want to make a better world for this place. And so how could, and, and yet the Democrats keep saying, oh, it's just all about oil, it's just about money. And I'm not making myself very clear. But I, I don't understand how a person could, or, or where, where do you find truth if, if, if they're both propagandizing and, and Bush obviously thinks that what he's doing is for the benefit of the people over there. Uh, well, did you all hear that? It's a question of there are, you know, these arguments on both sides and, uh, the, and propaganda on both sides and, and, and these people up at the top like Bush don't, you know, they also think they're doing good and we think we're doing good. So where, where do you end up, you know? How do you make a decision uh, face, well, uh, I don't know what's in Bush's mind. Nobody knows. Uh, 
Uh, no, I, no, I mean, seriously, I don't know what's in anybody's mind. I, you know, I, that is, I don't know about motivation, you know. I, I can't, does Bush really believe the things he says? Does Rumsfeld really believe? Uh, uh, does Kerry really believe the things he says? No, I don't know. I, I don't know what these people really believe. All I can do is judge their actions. That's all I can do. I can look at their actions and ask myself, you know, do their actions fit in with a better world, with a better country, with more freedom, with more democracy, with peace, with people being good to one another? I judge, I look at their actions. We, they may think they're doing great things. They may think they're doing wonderful things. I don't know that. All I can do is judge their actions, and judge their actions against certain principles of how human beings should behave and what the world should be like. And, uh, you know, and then I, based on that, I try to act upon the conclusions I come to. That's all I can do. Yes? Um, you were speaking earlier about how governments lie. And it hmm. seems to me that one of the ways that governments typically lie is through the use of euphemisms. Um, and there's a lot of euphemisms that I've seen the administration throwing around lately. And as somebody who's been documenting the trail of lies for so long, I was just wondering out of curiosity if there are any euphemisms that you've heard throughout the years that are particularly absurd or even humorous. <laughs> <laughs> euphemisms. <laughs> euphemisms. You mean like... Uh, <clears throat> Like when the uh, military intelligence. <laughs> well, that's there's a different name for that, right? <laughs> but you, but maybe, maybe, uh, uh, Roger, you're right. But uh, I think of the when the United States uh, spread all of this deadly chemical over a good part of Vietnam. Uh, and they called it Operation Ranch Hand. Uh, they, have names, they, have, they have names for operations, you know. A rolling thunder for the terrible bombardment of North Vietnam. Thunder isn't that terrible, but a bombardment is. I mean, we have all sorts of euphemism. Def the word defense is a euphemism. Defense, the word defense is used again and again. Uh, and uh, when, when it has nothing to do with defense. I mean, they, it's, it's interesting, at the end of World War II, it, you know, one, I don't know if you know about this, there was not always a Department of Defense, there was a Department of War, <laughs> and, and now it's a Department of Defense. Ex exactly at that point in history, when we started to make more war than ever before, it became a Department of Defense, when the military operations that we've had in all these years since World War II have not been about defense at all. So, I mean, there's, it seems, and, uh, you know, there are lots of other euphemisms and uh, in all these operations, you know, the operation in Panama and the operation in Grenada and, uh, and the various operations in, in Iraq. Uh, I, I won't go into all of them, but uh, you can pick them out yourself. Uh, back there. between uh, electoral politics and social, significant social change over, uh, throughout history. And I'm wondering if you could speak about that in, in light of our current electoral charade we're about to go through. Uh, in other words, that most significant social change has come from below, and that by putting the right pawn in office, we're suddenly going to be saved. You, you, uh, you've said it. <laughs> I mean, you, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Very often people who ask you questions know the answer. <laughs> but I'll, I'll say it anyway. But, no, but yeah, there's this is a point I have to try to make, and that is, yes, when important, uh, historically, when s important social changes have been made in this country, they haven't been made by electing one president or another. It may be helpful sometimes to have one president rather than another, but that has never been the initiating uh, event 
the initiating force for bringing about social change. And, uh, and you know, the, the, the whatever, uh, whatever uh, benefits were gained, whatever victories were gained by the labor movement in this country, like the winning the eight hour day to replace the 10 and 12 and 14 hour day, it was, it was not done by government. It was not done by electing a Democrat over a Republican or vice versa. It was done by the labor movement, by going on strike, by uh, uh, facing off the police and the National Guard and so on. And this is, this is you know, this is true of, you know, the, but you can see it in, you know, more recent times in uh, the, uh, <coughs> Black people in this country know this better than anybody else, so they should know it better than anybody else because the, the history of black people in this country is certainly not a history of making gains on the basis of having one president or another, but uh, they themselves. Uh, and the civil rights move, the, we did not get civil rights laws in 64 and 65 or end racial segregation because of things that Kennedy and Johnson initiated. We got them because uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of black people in the South took to the streets and, and risked their freedom and their lives and took beatings and, in order to, to create a commotion in the country which finally brought some changes. And you know, and you can, uh, so you want to apply this to the present time and uh, to this election. And yeah, and I would say that while I think it's better to have anybody than Bush, uh, any, literally, anybody. Uh, my, no, my brother-in-law. Uh, no, I, you could, uh, I could walk down the street and pick somebody out and put them in the White House and I'd feel safer. Seriously. So, uh, so, uh, so, so yes, it would be better to have somebody other than Bush, but it certainly won't be enough if we want to stop having wars and stop being a military nation. I mean, if you look at Kerry's record, uh, you will not, uh, you'll not be confident that we will, he will turn our country around from being an aggressive, warlike nation to being a, a, a peaceful nation. Not, no. Uh, therefore, it will take uh, a great social movement in this country uh, once we've made that first step, you know, of getting rid uh, of, Sad of, no, of Bush. Uh, once you made that first step, no, you, no, really, you get rid of a tyrant and then you have to do a lot of other things. So we get rid of Bush and then we get, we, and then we have Kerry around and, and then we, we have to have a movement which Kerry will have to listen to. Uh, in a way that, you know, yeah, even, even, even Nixon, even Nixon, it's not a matter of Democrats or Republicans, Nixon uh, uh, had to bring the war to an end at a certain, after, it took a long time, but he had to finally bring the war to an end because, uh, for one thing, there was a great movement in this country, uh, and a movement in the armed forces, a movement that could uh, not be satisfied any more except by uh, getting out of Vietnam. So, yeah, that, that, we will need that. Yes? Um, economically, why, why does the Middle East hate us economically? Why? The Middle East, why do they hate us economically? Why do they hate us economically? Uh, because they think that the United States, I don't know where they got this idea. They think the United States wants their oil. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, and they think that we'll do anything, and we will, they think that we will keep dictators in power in the Middle East if those dictators will give us access to oil. Just as we have kept the Saudi monarchy in power in Saudi Arabia since the end of World War II. You know, at the end of World War II, Roosevelt meets with King Ibn Saud uh, and uh, 1945, and uh, they really come to a deal, and the deal is the United States will now become will replace Britain as a major oil power in the Middle East, and in return, the United States will maintain the Saudi dictatorship and not bother it, and not, not, and not insist on regime change or democracy or anything like that. So there's, I think there's anger at, at, uh, our, uh, at our maintaining uh, 
not democracy, but lack of democracy in the Middle East and, and our greed for the resources of the Middle East. And uh, as I said, I think the Palestinian issue is a very, very important issue with them. Uh, yes. I think, uh, I, no, I think you're describing something accurately. As I think the European, or mostly accurately, as I think the, the European media is, is more honest than our media when it comes to evaluating the United States, <laughs> you see. And, uh, you know, they may, be, they may be less honest about, about evaluating their own country. Uh, but I, I do think, in general, the, the, the foreign press is... is uh, uh, well, certainly for us in the United States, the foreign press is a much better source of honest news than our own press. I mean, if, if you uh, really want to know what's, what's going on uh, in the Middle East or in other parts of the world, you know, you, you can't just read the American press. You have to read uh, the, the Guardian of London. You have to read, you know, uh, Le Monde. They have an English edition, too. Le Monde Diplomatique, which has more of uh, international news than by far than any American newspaper. And uh, uh, yeah, you, uh, you're basically right about that. Yes. Two more questions. Does that sound right, Helen? Yeah, sure. I'd like to take the liberty of asking a follow-up question on her question. Oh, OK. The you know, questions about the, the motivation of the press or the sleepiness of the press uh, are hard to, hard to answer. That, that is, uh, very often, the, 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 I mean, surely you would say the, the American press, don't they read other <laughs> newspapers? Uh, the, you know, doesn't the American press read the, the foreign press? Uh, and, uh, but, you know, the major media are psychologically tied to the government in very subtle but powerful ways. And their, their tendency is to play it safe, and their tendency is not to rock the boat, and not to, not to say anything troubling or disturbing. Uh, I mean, occasionally, of course, you know, something will come through. But, uh, no, it's, why is the press as cowardly as it is? You know, I, I don't, I can't always figure that out, but they are. I mean, I know that the press is, by its nature, by its multi-million dollar nature, tied to corporate power and the government. Uh, but even so, uh, they are, uh, you would think that uh, they would seize upon a story like that as simply an interesting story. Uh, but, um, but just uh, as, as an aside on, on the question of nuclear proliferation, 
we've seen such enormous hypocrisy on the part of this administration, the matter of, of nuclear proliferation. Oh, well. But the United States signed a nuclear proliferation treaty, uh, which not only required other uh, nations not to acquire nuclear weapons, that nuclear proliferation treaty, and here's another thing the press doesn't tell us, that nuclear proliferation treaty required the nuclear powers to begin to divest themselves of nuclear weapons as part of the bargain for non-nuclear states not acquiring nuclear weapons. And that, of course, the press hasn't reported on, and that, of course, the United States has not done. In fact, the United States, while it talks about stopping nuclear proliferation, they've just uh, in, in the budget, there's already, already billions of dollars for the development of a new set of nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, Jay? <laughs> Please, Jay. What do you think? It's up to you. It's up to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's nine o'clock. Who, who, it's nine o'clock. Huh? Who, uh, how many, who's really desperate? <laughs> These two kids down there, try them. I'll, I'll tell you, Jay, you choose. Okay. They go first. Where? Over here. Okay. Oh, they're in the newspaper. Okay, fine. You guys go, and then you guys go. Okay. You guys, and then you guys, and I'll be it. Okay, good. All right. Yeah. Um, and I was actually, I read before and I heard before that the U.S. government is somewhat afraid to imply that Saudi Arabia may in fact be more tied to things like Al Qaeda than Iraq is. Mm. And I was wondering what your thoughts on why the U.S. government is so afraid to imply that. <laughs> Well, there's one government in the world that sits on more oil reserves than Iraq, and that's Saudi Arabia. And as I was said, the United States has this deal with Saudi Arabia. We, you know, we, want, we, we don't want to rock any kind of boat in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so they have these enormous oil reserves and oil production. So, so the United States is not likely to, and of course we didn't, right? Remember, after 9-11, it was disclosed that most of the hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. They weren't from Afghanistan, they weren't from Iraq, they were from Saudi Arabia. But no, that, that was played down. But the United States uh, doesn't want to fool around with uh, governments that do what we want them to do. And Saudi Arabia has been doing what we want them to do. We want military bases? Here, take it. We want oil? Here, take it. Just, you know, leave us in power. Yes. What, what do I think the United States should do in regard to the Palestinian conflict? <laughs> Whatever goodwill I managed to create in the course of this evening will at least to some extent dissipate at this moment, I'm sure. Just throw something at it. Just throw something at it. The United States, <clears throat> well, the root of the problem there is the occupation, period. That's the root. That's the root of the problem. Uh, sure, that, you know, you can talk about the suicide, the, you know, it's terrible. Suicide bombers, terror, you know, well, it's all true. But the root of it all is the occupation. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, and the United States has just not been strong in dealing with Israel because it's Israel's initiative to get out of the occupied territories. It doesn't require, it doesn't require complicated and fancy uh, negotiations that go on for years and years. You know, in Vietnam, what was required in Vietnam was for the United States to get out of Vietnam, period. There's no need to go to the Paris Peace Table, which we did in 1968. And only five years later, in 1973, four and a half years later, did we come to uh, finally an agreement, you know, 
something that could have been agreed on just like that. Well, it didn't even need to be agreed on because the United States just had to get out of Vietnam. Israel just has to get out. And, and for it to get out, it, it won't do it. it will, there are only two forces that can act on Israel to, to compel Israel to get out of the occupied territories. One is Israelis themselves. You know, and there are many Israelis who are opposed to the occupation, but they don't have the political power. And it's very difficult and called unpatriotic and all of that. One force is the Israelis themselves. The other force is the aid that the United States gives to Israel. The United States should use the billions of dollars of aid that it gives to Israel as a, a, a weapon to say to the Israelis, uh, we are not going to support you anymore unless you get out of the occupied territory. You know. I know that some of Howard's books are on sale. Uh, the Marble College Bookstore has them out in the lobby. So, um, great. Thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>